We are actually working on the third book now. For a variety of reasons, it's had to be put aside, but uh, we have not given up on Ordinary Farm. We very much want to finish the story and, if possible, maybe write more later on. But the third book is being worked on now. I don't know exactly when, but it is, will be ready. But it is actually being worked on at this moment. We've been talking about it and planning it, so. Well, actually, my wife um, was originally my British publisher, and she is the business part of our partnership. So she knows that if you have something that people already like, it, it, it makes a certain sense, business sense, to go back to it. But I have always said, um, I will never write something unless the story comes first. You know, I can't just go back and, and you know, invent something from nothing without feeling a story. So I was trying to explain this to her again, because she kept saying, why don't you ever write more Ostinard books, more about Simon, more about Miriam L. And as I was lying in bed trying to think of all the reasons why I wasn't able to just come up with a story, I started thinking of how long it had been since I wrote the books, nearly 30 years, and how much I had changed during that time. And I began to think about how the characters in the book would have changed in that amount of time. So you have people who were, what we would say, teenagers at the end of the, the story. 30 years later, they're going to be middle-aged adults and you know, having lived this life that we didn't know about um, at the end of the story. And other characters would have gotten old and new generations would have come along. And as I began to think about that, ideas began to come, and before I knew it, I had originally started to tell her why I couldn't write another one, but by the time I'd spent a night thinking about it, the story was beginning to come so quickly, I went and I said, curse you, woman, curse you, you have now gotten me back into Ostinard, and then, you know, from that point on, it was like any other book. I had the story in my mind, and I wanted to tell it. I honestly think that, again, it's different between the English version, obviously, and the, the German version where they have to split into different volumes. But the English version, I am close to 100% certain, will actually be three books, which is what a trilogy is supposed to be. So I think for once, I will actually manage. And one of the reasons I know is because I've just finished the second book, and it's longer than the first. So that means I've gotten very far into the story, and I think I can finish it in the third book. Well, I don't want to give away too much about the second book, but the, the Witchwood Crown, uh, the, the Hexenholzkrone, I think we say in German, um, is, uh, it takes place about 30 years after the events in the, um, the first series, The Dragon Bone Chair, Stone of Farewell, to Green Angel Tower. And what has happened is that the, um, the Queen of the Norns, who is the, the, the sort of nearly immortal leader of the, 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 the dangerous folks, the dangerous immortals, has recovered from her sleep and she is still angry and she has plans and we don't know what all the plans are but the Norns are beginning to move into action again and but there are also many many other things going on Simon and Miriam L have been the the king and queen for many years now and they have a very difficult problem with their grandson who is their heir who is um, not really very mature, and we also begin to see problems that are developing in other countries as well that will all, inter that will all uh, interlock into this story. So by the end of the first book, um, we kind of see how everybody has gotten pulled off into what seem like different things, but we also, the readers begin to understand that they are actually all somewhat connected. The second book, it's hard to say anything about without giving things away, but I can tell you that the second book um, is, is got a lot of twists and turns, and the queen goes south, Miriam L, and so she is involved in this very dangerous court um, in Naban in the south, and there's all kinds of intrigue and murder and things going on there that she's trying to keep down. And uh, Morgan, the grandson, has disappeared into the forest and various other things are happening. But as with all my stories, there are many characters, many plot lines all intersecting. 
Um, and there are a lot of twists and turns in the second book. And I think there will be even more in the third book. And I hope to have to really surprise some readers. Oh, the second book is called Empire of Grass. And the third book, the final volume, will be called The Navigator's Children. No, I was very careful with The Witchwood Crown to think of readers who would be starting here, who had not read the earlier books. So most of the important things that the readers need to know that happen in the first books are, are actually talked about, come up, are mentioned in the Witchwood Crown. So you could read those books without ever reading the earlier ones. Um, but for people who have read the earlier books, they will be coming back to familiar characters and things like that. So that's also a good way to read it. But no, I've tried very hard to make sure that someone could pick up the first book of the new series and not be confused by what's going on and not feel I'm missing something. Well, I've certainly changed a lot, but as I said, there are also the new generations coming up. So we have not just Morgan, who is the grandson of the king and queen, but we have other characters. There is a young Norn woman named Nezeru, or Nezeru, who is uh, uh, herself um, half mortal, half mortal, and is been, you know, uh, become a, essentially a warrior for the Norns, but she is also beginning to have questions about her society. And there are other youngish characters as well. So there's a new generation of characters, but there's still a lot of focus on Simon and Miriamel and Binabic and the characters that people know from the first books. Well, that's actually one of the mysteries that people will not know for certain until the end of the story. I, that's very much, um, I, I will warn them that you will not find out exactly what the Witchwood Crown is on, at the end of the first book. It is still a mystery, and that's a big part of what the story is. So it's something that's been set up, but will not be fully explained until the end of the story. I would say it probably took me about two years to write the first book because I had to go back and relearn all of my own story, reread the books, um, enlist the help of some very, very smart readers who have read the books many more times than me. I did not ever read them after I wrote them. You know, I don't read my own books. So there are people who have read these books every year, you know, the way I used to read Tolkien when I was young. So um, some of them are very smart fans and readers and, of, and friends of mine, and they helped me out with uh, getting details right and finding things quickly, you know. Um, because, for instance, one of them plays a, does a role-playing game based on Ostenard. So he's actually mapped out mileage and things like that, you know, and he remembers where all the, the roads are and things like that. Um, so... It took me a longer time. I've written the second book, which is actually longer than the first, in about a year. But I spent a lot of time planning the, the first book before I actually started writing it. So altogether, it was about two years. I wouldn't say it's that I prefer them. I actually like all kinds of different approaches to writing. And I really enjoyed writing the Bobby Dollar books because they were more like crime novels with uh, you know one main character telling the story and that was very fun for me because I just could go straight ahead but I do also like these big books and part of it is because the the world of the story becomes so complex that that things I don't anticipate come up out of the complexity there is an emergent order where you you learn things as you go as you're writing the books so also, I'm somebody now who's done, this is my fourth or fifth long series, so I'm pretty good at it. And, and I realize that a lot of my readers really like those kinds of stories where they can throw themselves deeply into the world. So um, even though they're more difficult to write in some ways, there's also a real pleasure in 
putting up together these very complex stories and making everything fit together, you know, weaving the tapestry, as it were. And since the readers also like them, then, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, one of the things we realize as we have, you know, as we spend time in our career as writers is that your readers, your fans, if you want to use that word, are your best friends. And they are the people who are, you know, paying for you to be a writer. So if they like certain types of things that you do, pay attention, you know, learn from that. No, actually, and that's why it was, it was interesting for me to have other people involved in helping me with details in this story. And it was only because they actually knew the books better than I did because of reading them more often. But I tend to keep my entire story in my head. That's how I do it. And um, I've just always had a very good memory. I find it's easier for me to, to try different things before I write them down. So I play these sort of mental games. I literally lie down for a couple of hours every day before I do my writing, and I try different things out in my head, sort of like you know making models. I'll say, well, if I do it this way, then, then that will have an influence on this here. But it's too early for that, so instead I'll connect it over here, but I'll connect this one in. You know, so it's, a, it's like playing four-dimensional chess. You're trying all the possibilities in your head to see what works best. Then when I actually sit down, I'm ready to write, and I will write maybe 10 pages in a fairly short amount of time, instead of doing a little bit and thinking and doing a little bit and thinking. So I've always been lucky enough to have a good memory, and for me it works best to keep it in my head until I'm ready to write it down. What happened to his family and his marriage um, is, is in The Witchwood Crown. Yeah, but nearly at the end. Nearly at the end, yeah. But that's because where he was one of the main characters in, in uh, The Heart of What Was Lost, he's one of the supporting characters, a smaller character. So you mostly see him through the eyes of other characters, like the grandson, the prince, Morgan, who knows him as this old man who drinks a lot, you know? Um, but the readers, if they've read the, the heart of what was lost, will be wondering how did that man from that book turn into that poor old guy? But in fact, Porto has more and more to do in the second book. And he has a whole, we would say, an arc of his own. Um, he, is, he is not beyond great, greatness still in his life. So, uh, but, but in the first book of the new trilogy, he's definitely a minor character and I'm more talking to the readers who've already read about him and, and trying to make them wonder. And then we find out a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, well, Yarika is, is, is gone by the end of The Heart of What Was Lost. So Vieki, who was his assistant, becomes a very major character and is the father of another major character in The Witchwood Crown. And we find out lots about him. Um, and uh, he is going to be very, very important. All the Norns that we are following will be very, very important by the end of the, of the story. Mm -hmm. Well, and, but also remember we're, we're also comparing this to the very first books where they were almost entirely like, say like Tolkien's orcs or something, you know, where you, they had very little personality. They were just frightening. They were dark and mysterious. So these books, um, one of the things I want to do is we all know how we as humans, when we are at war or in conflict with people, we tend to make them into caricatures. We, we, we make them, we reduce them to an enemy that's easy to hate. And I definitely did that with them in the first books. And now I want to turn that around so that the readers will say, but wait, I just wanted to hate them. I just want to be afraid of them. I don't want to feel sympathy for them. But the world is always complicated. And so I like to make things more complicated. And I wanted also to have a different feeling to these books. I did not want to simply redo the, the same story again. I did not want to make it like you know, in the, in, the, in the films where they make, you know, sequels to action movies. And it's the same thing again, just, they just re, 
jiggle the, the, the characters or something. But I did not want to write the same book over again. I'm a different person. I have new things to say as well as the old things. And I wanted to take the readers to some different places. Actually, it was, it was much less interesting <laughs> than that. Um, it, it, the actual truth is that when I had um, uh, sent in the outline and, and for the Witchwood Crown and the trilogy, and my publishers had said, yes, great, okay, you know, go ahead. And then my American publishers, who are my first publishers, um, had a big corporate merger. And because of the big corporate merger, they had to say to me, um, sorry, we have to put the book back one year. Now, you know, this is for like a normal person, you know, if you are a bus driver or a teacher and they just said, okay, next year you don't get paid, you know? So um, we, are not, we are not wealthy people. We make a living from writing, you know, but we're not rich. We don't have years and years worth of money waiting in a bank for us. So I said at that point, all right, I will have to write something else in that time. But I had some ideas, so I wrote I wrote, uh, I, I, I made these two short novels, because there will be another one. I made these two short novels, and I, I you know, said to the publishers, you know, if we have to, De my wife Deborah and I will publish these ourselves, you know, to make sure we have an income for that year. And they said, oh, we don't want you to publish um, another Ostenard book on your own. They, we want them all together. So then they came back to us and offered us for those books as well. So I round, wound up writing The Heart of What Was Lost first, and I think the last one may come either between the second and third or after the third book because it's set far back in time. So it doesn't really have, it's all about the history of Ostenard, but you don't need to know it to appreciate this story. Well, one of the things that's very important to me as a writer is that the characters feel real. So when you're writing characters that do unexpected things, I don't want to spoil things either, when you write characters who do unexpected things, you have to give the reader enough information that when it does happen, they don't feel like it was just a trick. Right? You, you have to give the reader enough about the characters that when the character makes a big change or does something surprising, the audience says, wow, I'm surprised, but they also say, but now I can see, you know, that was, there was a little bit of that before and now I understand it. So, but I'm a big believer that your characters, you have to give them credit. You have to treat them as though they're real people. And that means they don't always do expected things, you know, and they don't always fit the role. They're not like chess pieces where you can just say, this is a bishop or this is a knight and it's going to do this. Um, they're too individual for that. And sometimes you will get to that point and go, I want this character to do this. And you realize now, two years after writing that character, no, that character would not do that. And then you have to come up with a new plan. But it's mostly about treating the characters as though they're real and letting them develop themselves. I am not somebody who kills characters just for effect. I, I, I try not to, um, although there have always been times when I have said, I think this character needs to go, and I do it. Um, in the first books, uh, without, because some people may still read the first books who don't know them yet, but Simon has a, a, a mentor character who is a little like Gandalf or somebody, you know, who is the wise character who tells him about the world. And I decided I wanted to remove him from the story and not bring him back you know, take him out of the story, but he lives on because of his writing. And the character of Simon has a book of his that he's written in the first one. So he still remains as a character in the same way that I as an author will remain after I'm dead. You know, I won't be here, but my stories and my thoughts will still be around. Research is very important, and it's always funny to me how I've had people say, many people say, um, how is it that, that uh, you know, it must be great to be a fantasy writer because you never have to do any research. You just make it up. 
<coughs> excuse me, and I, you know, I always kind of just stare at them when they say that because I'm trying to create realistic worlds. I'm trying to create in the Ostinard books a realistic pre-industrial world. It's not the world we live in now. It, yes, it's imaginary, but it's based on the way people used to live. And that is very different from how we live now. And I have to know as a writer how those economies worked. How did people get from place to place? How long did it take them? What did they eat? How did they prepare it? All those kinds of things if I'm going to write convincingly and the reader is going to feel, ah, I'm in good hands. This guy knows what he's talking about. So no, I do a huge amount of research and I really love it, so I'm not complaining. But I'm always doing research all the time. I have just, you know, the books that I've used in, in um, writing even just the first book, The Witchwood Crown. You know, I have stacks of books that I've used for that that fill half a bookshelf or more. Um, and then, of course, I use the internet now, too. So, you know, that you don't have to stack up in your room, but it's still a lot of information. So, no, I research all the time. It's very important for me. I am very much, um, even though I love history and I love old myths and folklore and things like that, I am also very much a person of the present. I'm very political. Um, I don't believe in lecturing about politics when you're writing fiction. I think you, that your, your, yourself comes through in the story and what you think is interesting and what you think is important without having to put you know, big stars around it and say, here is the political message. I don't have a political message to share with people. I don't believe that I know so much about the world that I can tell everyone else how to live. But what does come through are the things that interest me, concern me, worry me. And I, I'm enough of a, a lover of history that I know that human beings don't change that much. Society changes, technology changes, people are very similar. You know, if people were not stupid 5,000 years ago. They were not stupid in the Middle Ages. There were reasons why they were not as informed as we are, but they were still people and very complex and very subtle. So that's always important to me to, to show complexity, to show nuance, to show that these are things we always wrestle with. You know, how do you fight something without hating? You know, where do you draw the line on those things? How do you deal with other cultures that are overwhelming? You know, how do you not be swept away by a, a, a bigger or more powerful culture? All those kinds of things are very interesting to me. So they make it into the book, but I try not to do it like I'm standing on a lectern, you know, wagging, wagging my finger at people. Oh yeah, yeah. As I mentioned, I, the, the only thing that, with these books that was different is that people helped me, um, particularly these two friends, um, Ron and Ilva, who's German, um, helped me with the, the, uh, the Ostenard stuff, that, and, and mostly in the sense that I could quickly get an answer from them. If I say, I could say, did I kill such and such a character off in the first books? Do you remember? And they could usually tell me right away, yeah, you, you killed her off already. And I go, okay, fine, then I'll have to find someone else to use. Um, but as far as all the other research, yes, I do that myself because the, uh, there's kind of a rule in, in writing of you only put a small percentage of what you've studied in the books. Otherwise, you overwhelm people with information. But I have to know these things and feel comfortable with them before I make the choices of what to use. So yeah, I, I just, I read all the time. Um, I don't get much time to read fiction these days. I'm reading mostly nonfiction, mostly science and history. Um, and fortunately for me, I, I love that. You know, I do it anyway, I enjoy it. But no, I'm researching all the time. I don't know how other writers are. I know that everybody is a little bit different. Um, one of the things that I've learned with me is that I do best if I think it through ahead of time. As I mentioned, because I, I need to try different things in my head because the stories are so complicated and I need to see how I can fit them together and still do the storytelling of having exciting things happen and information being given to the reader and character development. So. I do sort of my business stuff in the mornings. 
most days, um, you know, answer mail and things like that. And then I'll usually go after lunch and lie down for a couple of hours uh, or sit or whatever and think about what I'm going to work on. And then near, later in the afternoon, I will actually sit down. But as I said, only for uh, maybe two hours. And I will do that day's writing because I've thought ahead of time. And, and I pretty much am just typing the whole time. I haven't thought everything through, but I know the basics of what I'm going to do. There's going to be a scene. It's going to be these characters. This one wants this. This one wants this. But there's also this going on in the background. You know, so I get enough of an idea that I'm really ready to write the scene instead of trying to figure it out while I'm sitting there. Um, I, I use music to think because I live in a house with three young people between the ages of 18 and 20 who are almost always playing loud video games. So um, I, I actually wear my earbuds um, most of the day in the house and I listen to uh, music that does not have lyrics, you know, no words, so, because those will get into my brain and influence me. I learned that, um, I was listening to, who was it? Elvis Costello, who's a great favorite of mine. But then I sat down to write that afternoon and I was writing like Elvis Costello songs. You know, it had that rhythm and those kinds of wordplay. And so I listen to things like ambient and classical and some jazz when I'm thinking. And it, mostly I use it to block other things off. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the time I listen to music for fun and then I can listen to whatever I want. But that's very much a, a function, you know. It's, it's like seal out the world so I can think. It's always a line, a, a, a balance. Because on the one hand, if I try to figure out everything ahead of time, every single bit, I can't do it. I don't, when I'm first starting a story, I don't know everything well enough to know everything. But the other side of the balance is I have to know enough because I will be foreshadowing things and leaving clues and things that will not, we would say in English, will, will not pay off until two books later. When it's already published, you know, the first two volumes are published, I can't do anything to fix it then. So I have to figure some things about the ending out when I'm starting and some general shape of everything and have some ideas about what the most important scenes are going to be. I may not know all the details. So for me, it's always a balance between if I, if I don't know enough, I cannot write it the way I want, which is that I want to write these multi-volume stories so that they read as one story. So things you find out in the beginning are paid off at the end, like Chekhov's pistol. You know, you, you set it up and then later on you pay it off. So I have to know some things so I can do that early work. But by the time I write a whole trilogy or, you know, a four book series or whatever, that's sometimes five, six years of work. And I'm thinking every day about this story and I learn more about the characters and I learn more about the world and I think more about the complex situations. So I have to leave myself open also to that, to make the story richer and to come up with things I wasn't ready to come up with early. So it's always like a tightrope walker. You don't go too far to one side or too far to the other and you just try to keep balanced. No particular reason except that I was trying to be a little faster this time. Um, I'm very, I was very much interested in trying to get these books out fairly quickly because some of my other friends in the field are, are not finishing their stories and I've always been pretty good at finishing so I didn't want to add things to it. And although I loved doing the maps, always in the past, um, it wasn't like, I didn't feel like if someone else do, does the maps, it won't be my book. I didn't feel that way. So the uh, gentleman who did the maps, Isaac, is a very, very good map maker and he volunteered. He said, I'd like to do your maps. And here's my work and you can see I've, he does for Brandon Sanderson and other people. And um, I just said, 
that would be wonderful. That's one less thing that I have to think about while I'm trying to make this incredibly complicated story. And his maps are beautiful, so I don't think anybody's losing anything by me not doing them. Binbinake Gabinik. That's his name. Binbinake Gabinik. Well, some of that is because that's the readers really want to know. In a way, I've never worried whether people pronounce the names right. And in fact, here's, here's a, a, a strange but true fact. I pronounce many of the names wrong myself because especially with the beginning of The Dragon Bone Chair, which was only the second book I ever wrote, um, I was making up names before I knew how the languages worked. So I didn't know the rules. So some characters had names that then when I explained the rules, I realized that doesn't fit those rules. So I still pronounce them wrong. So I can't get very upset with anyone else. Um, but the readers really like it. And, and I also like people to be able with these very long stories to have something they can go back to and say, I think that's who that character is. But I don't want to have to go back and read the whole story again. And they can find it and go, oh, yes, that, that was it. But it's also because it gives a sense of the, you're trying to make something that feels real. And that's also important, that the languages have rules, that the cultures have things that you get to know. And if somebody does something that doesn't feel right, you'd notice. So it's all about making a world that people can go into and feel they're in something real while they're reading. only puts pressure on us in the sense that I think most of us would like to see a really good TV or film version of our work, you know? Um, and I, I would love that myself. Um, one of the things that was so very exciting about Game of Thrones for people in my field was it was one of the first times that somebody did a really good adaptation of a story. Um, many of the best stories in fantasy and science fiction when they got made into movies were very, uh, you know, and especially because movies often have to compress things so much. So, um, but Game of Thrones was really exciting because it showed that you can take a big complicated story like this and, and make it into a, an exciting drama. So. The only pressure that I feel is that, you know, like a lot of people, I would like to see some of my work get done that way because it expands your audience so much. And, and it also makes money, you know, and all of us who are making a living doing anything, you know, none of us are saying, please don't give me any money. You know, I don't want, money will just complicate my life. No, money will help pay for my kids to go to college. Money will pay my, my mortgage for my house. Money feeds the dogs and the cats, you know. So um, I have no problem with that. But I would want it to be, like Game of Thrones, a good version because, of course, my work is very important to me. There are always approaches. There are always things going on these days where people are interested or they take an option or something like that, which it means that they're, they're thinking about it. Um, there is, for instance, there is a pretty definite now that there will be an animated film of my first book, Tail Chaser Song, and that's gotten to be sort of a bigger project than when it started, so it's taken a long time. But as for the other things, there, there's interest, there are people talking about it. But to be honest with you, the film and television business, if you spend too much time thinking about it and caring about it, because for every one thing that happens, there are like 20 that turn into nothing. So when, you know, when I first started out, anytime someone said, we're interested in you know, making a film of such and such, and I would get all excited and I'd prepare things for them and do all this stuff. And then you learn after a while that very few of these things come true. Um, in fact, that was, um, I, I know one of the things that I'm known for in Germany is the, uh, the radio play of Otherland. And when Walter Adler first came to me with this thing for the radio play, he said, um, I, I, I'm going to do this. I really intend to do this, and it's going to be really good, but I'm going to have to go get money from various places to put it together so you, know, you won't hear from me for a while. Now, I had just met him. That was the, the day that I met him. 
And I said, well, he seems like a really neat guy, but I'm sure nothing will ever happen. And I literally did not think about it again until like two years later, he called us and said, it's all set up, you know, and it turned into this great thing, which has been really wonderful for me in Germany. Um, but, you know, you're so used to nothing happening that if there's silence for a while, you just assume, nah, it didn't happen. Well, I didn't write the original script. This is one of the reasons this has taken so long. This was a project that developed from someone else's script of my book. But now at this point, um, we have a director, a quite well-known director of animated films and things like that, who I can't say the name yet because everything's not signed. But that director um, is going back to work on the script again, and I think I will be involved in that process of of, of kind of bringing it back closer to the book. Not specific things, because I'm usually several years ahead of the people I'm talking to, you know. I'm usually working on a project that, you know, they don't even know yet what I'm writing, because it's, you know, they're reading one book, and I, like I said, I've already finished Empire of Grass. So the people that I will talk to tonight are just reading The Witchwood Crown. But what I do try to pay attention to is the mood of people. And if people are liking the things I want them to like, if they are unhappy with things, I try to sense that. I try to see, okay, what is, what is, what is not working for them? Is this a, a more than a few people? Is this you know, representative of a bigger group that this complaint or whatever? But generally when I'm doing like readings or question and answer sessions, most people are so polite and so nice and they're there because they like your work. So they're mostly too shy to say anything negative. So that's why I have, you know, editors and agents and, and my wife who used to be a, my publisher and is a very good reader because they, that's their job is to say to me, this didn't work, this is too slow. I don't really understand this character, you know? Whereas the readers tend to just want to say, when's the next book coming, you know, things like that, which is, which is lovely and, and very important for me. That really makes a difference. <laughs> well, what I did say, um, as I was working on this, especially the second volume, The Empire of Grass, I realized that there are some really interesting characters and situations that I'm setting up that will not necessarily be part of this trilogy. So I said to my wife, I am horrified, but I can see another Ostin Ard series possible up the line. To which my wife just said, you know, whatever, if that's what you want to do. So if that continues, and those ideas are still there saying, you know, this is something that would be fun to tell, now that I've gone back and enjoyed going back, which I'd never done before, now I can see it. I can see that I might write another one somewhere up the road. Probably not the next thing, but, but somewhere up the road again. <laughs>